For tapes, CDs, DVDs, or our publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, write P.O. Box 21516, Hot Springs, Arkansas, Zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Tuesday afternoon, December the 27th, 1977. Lake Hamilton Bible Camp Midwinter Conference and Camp Meeting. This tape is with Brother Wynn Worley speaking on and teaching on deliverance. Let's uh, turn in our Bibles to Luke chapter 4. I look down to verse 16. Jesus has come out of the desert and begins his public ministry. He goes into Galilee in verse 14, and fame spreads about him. And now he goes to his hometown in verse 16. He comes to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. I know that people are always talking about being free, being at liberty. But a lot of people have decided that to be free is to have the license to act stupidly. Now, liberty and license are not the same thing. We are set free not to follow our own desires and dictates, but rather to be able to follow the Word of God and the Spirit of God more closely than we ever have been. God does not set us free in order for us to do our own thing. God is not going to deliver you in order for you to go ahead and be comfortable in your indifference and callousness and carelessness. God sets people free for the purpose of filling them with His Holy Spirit to be more effective in the work of the Lord than they've ever been. Now, deep in the heart of every born-again Christian, there's a deep desire there that came from God. It wasn't anything we dreamed up. It wasn't something we worked up. It wasn't something we went to the big meeting and got all steamed up about. It's a desire that's planted deep in the heart of every believer to really walk after God. And one of the most frustrating things in the world is for the believer to be thwarted in this and to be twisted out of shape and to be forced, he thinks, by circumstances inside and outside of him that keep him from achieving what God wants him to have in the way of balance in his spiritual experience. And you find all along the roadway wrecks of humanity who have been destroyed and been crushed by the fact that they cannot hack the fact that they can't achieve their spiritual potential. Now, some of them have turned mean and calloused and said, I throw up my hands on the whole thing. Forget it. I tried that route. Did you ever run across people like that? They're hard to reach. Because they're convinced they have tried everything in the books and nothing worked. Well, they didn't try everything in the book because they didn't try deliverance. I've never found one yet that had tried that. The reason they didn't try it was because they weren't taught it. The reason they weren't taught it... Now I'm back to my favorite theme again. <laughs> the reason deliverance is not taught is, first of all, unbelief. Let me repeat that. The reason deliverance is not taught in the average church is unbelief. In Mark 16, Jesus said, Those who believe in my name shall they cast out devils. People come to me and they say, Well, why are the demons manifesting in your church? They don't do that over at our place. I said, They don't. I said, Do you suppose it's because we don't have any? I said, No, some of your folks have been over here. They're full of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, then why don't they manifest? I said, Do you really want to know? I try to, you know, be gentle. <laughs> then I take them, I said, supposing I tell you, let you read the Bible, and, and then you figure it out. And I have them read the Mark 16 reference. Those who believe in my name shall they cast out devils. I say, whoa, whoa, stop right there. Who is it that is going to cast out demons? Those who believe. Why then would you not cast out demons? Unbelief. Now, I didn't make that up, and I didn't force that on the Scripture. That's just what Jesus said. <laughs> I used to have an old Bible prop, and he said, he used to say sometimes that people read things out of the Scripture, they, or read things into the Scripture, they could never read them out of the Scripture, because it's not there. They have to read it in, you know. 
But you don't read that into the Scripture. You just read what Jesus said. He said, in my name, those who believe shall cast out demons. If you don't cast out demons, just simply because you don't believe. That's the first reason. There's another reason that backs that one up. Spiritual pride. Big as a rhinoceros. And just as nasty to get tangled up with. If you want to get somebody fix you up and slander you and be ugly to you, get somebody full of spiritual pride. And you trample across their doorstep and see what happens. Don't come talking to me about deliverance. I'll show you my Sunday school buttons. <laughs> my pedigree is a mile long. Well, that's the trouble. They need to get rid of their pedigree and get delivered. We need to get back to what the simplicity of the Bible. See, men always make things complicated. Jesus made it simple. Men make it complicated. Jesus said, those who believe in my name, and I thought I was going to preach from Luke. Uh, Jesus said, in my name, those who believe are going to cast out devils. So what do they come to me? And they say, I think it's wonderful, this gift that God has given you with. I say, what, what, what? You know, I think that'd be great, you know, what? Maybe they overlooked something. I didn't know I had anything special. Oh, this gift of casting out spirits. I said, oh, that. Well, that's no gift. Everybody has that. Oh, no. Oh, yes. The Bible said, those who believe in my name, they'll cast out devils. Not those who go to seminary. Not those who are ordained. Not those who have special gifts or special calling. But those who do what? believe. I brought a letter with me from San Diego I got just this week, a young lady who attended one of the meetings in Los Angeles. A carloads drove up from San Diego to be in that meeting. We had 70, 80 people hanging in that house. I'm telling you, they, that thing was packed to the reactor. The demons were screaming all over the place. It was just delightful. <laughs> I mean, they got to carry it on, you know, and I say, they're singing my song. I like to hear the enemy in misery. I go from place to place causing as much as I can handle and put it on them as heavy as possible. But this young lady, and she'd never been around deliverance at all, but she kind of got carried away. And she wrote me this long letter. Ted was reading it last night. And she's working at a Christian school. And, brother, they'd already cornered one in a five-year-old kid. And they just went to work on it. She said the elder that was there didn't know anything about deliverance, said, but he sure found out when that thing started speaking out. And she went after that thing and got that kid some relief. Isn't that great? Yeah. One of the things that's so beautiful is the fact that you don't have to be dead with old age before you do this. You don't have to go through some intensive course. Uh, what I generally do when I go in a meeting where they, they haven't had deliverance much, or they don't know much about deliverance, I get invited into a place and I go in and maybe I'm the only one there a lot of times, unless my wife goes with me, that has done much deliverance work. Or maybe there's one or two people there. But what I do, I get busy in the first night or two. I'll deliver some folks, get some folks delivered. The next night, I throw them into the battle. I say, come up here and help me. And I get them started. And I say, now you go ahead and get that out, and I'll go get another one started. You know. I did Brother Ferris that way the other night, and he acted ugly about it. After did not wasn't even appreciative. <laughs> no, but seriously... Uh, the workers will just come. They'll come out of the people that have been delivered. Now, don't worry about those who are looking off at you like, you know, like calf looking at a new gate. They're, no, they're not ready yet. But those who just fall right in and get all excited because they see Jesus magnified, because they've tasted the freedom that Jesus has for the delivered ones, those are your boys. That's the new recruits. Throw them into the battle. And you who are new recruits, don't you hang back. Just move right in there and... Pray quietly and watch and listen. If you get around somebody that knows more than you do, listen to them. Listen, this deliverance business, you rotate. Every bit of help is, is, is good. Anybody has got a crowbar, let them stick it in there and prize on that thing. When they get wore out, back them off, run another one in. One thing the demons hate at our church, they say, the trouble with you stupid things, you don't ever give up. When one bunch gets tired, you just run a fresh one in there. And that's right. We have some eager... Bird dog just waiting, pointing that thing, you know, just, can I get, can I get it now? Okay, here, come on, get him. And we just keep him under constant pressure. Fine, the demons are just spare, just give up. <laughs> I like to see the enemy in despair, don't you? 
Listen, I've been pastoring 31 years, and I've seen so many Christians in deep despair, crushed till they couldn't hardly raise up, and I've been crushed myself. And I've seen those dirty birds do so much dirt to the believers and the children of God, just crush them and mangle them and chew them up and spit them out and then laugh at them. You think I'm not going to enjoy it when they're getting it? I'm sorry, friends. I thoroughly enjoy what I'm doing. Just flow with the Holy Spirit. Now, you don't have to... You, I'm not saying that this work is not dirty. This work is not dangerous. It is. Those things are telling the truth when they say, I'd like to smear your brains against that wall. And really. You know what I do? I look at them and I grin and I say, well, you don't get to do everything you want to, do you? <laughs> Don't laugh at me, Winworthy. Oh, listen, I believe in getting those things out of there. We may not be doing it the right way or the best way, but we're doing it the best way we know. And when we learn a new way, we do it that way. Had a good time this morning. I loosed some spirits of God on some of them in there, and they was having a fit. I'm preaching on loosing the spirits of God before I leave here. That ought to cause a commotion in your churches when you get back. <laughs> yes, sir. There's a congregation about 2,000 up in Toronto, and they're they're rocking and tilting all over the place, and they don't even know what it is. And there's one couple, a Dutch couple, in there got the crowbar under them, and they're pulling on it. And they're loosening spirits and binding spirits, and nobody knows about it except me and them and the Lord. <laughs> well, they asked me what could they do to help their church. <laughs> I told them, bind spirits of deception and loose the spirits of truth and conviction on that place. And 2,000 members are feeling the impact. After two months, they wrote me and said, it's the most amazing thing. People are standing up and saying, I don't know what's the matter with me. I just feel so convicted. Now, before, they're so proud and arrogant. And, oh, I'm just doing great and this, that, and that. And now then, they said, I just, the Lord's really been dealing with me. I want you to pray for me. I'm getting back to the Bible. I just feel like I've drifted from the Lord. <laughs> Now, one couple's putting that much leverage on one uh, 2,000 people. They're binding the spirits of deception and loosing the spirits of truth on them. Lord, I'm trying to get back to this message. <laughs> In Luke, when Jesus stood up, they handed him the, verse 17, the book of the prophet Isaiah to read. And Jesus opened and read a specific place and said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the rich. Oh, oh, oh. Yours doesn't say that? I nearly choked one time. We went to a meeting. Uh, you're too close to that. I won't mention the town. But uh, in the nearby state, I went to preach a meeting, and the pastor's wife told my wife very proudly, the Lord has called us to work with the millionaires in this town. I told my wife, if the Lord was calling somebody to work with the wealthy people, he wouldn't call a shyster like that preacher. <laughs> I said, those people have been conned by experts. They'd see through him in a minute. Oh, listen, isn't that pitiful? Call to work with the millionaires. <laughs> my, my, my. Jesus said, I was called to preach the gospel to the poor folk. That doesn't mean rich folks can't get saved, but they're harder to handle than the poor folks, so they don't have much to hang on to. The rich folks are busy managing their money. They don't have much time to think about the Lord. Poor folks are uh, about starved to death, so they're looking for something, and the Lord sometimes can get to them. Of course, they can be mean as a snake, too, but uh, anyhow, Jesus said, I came to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the broken heart. And how many believers are going around causing broken hearts rather than healing them? Our ministry is to heal the broken heart. Listen, do you know how many people are hurt and broken hearted in our churches? I'm not talking about in the world. I'm talking about in the churches, in Bible-believing churches. I'm not talking about apostate groups that are deny the Bible. I'm talking about fundamental Bible-believing groups of believers. Inside those, that's the Lord has put that on my heart. To go inside, the best mission field that's open is the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's hurting from head to toe. She's filled with broken hearts, and there's nobody 
it seems, that cares. Everybody's busy covering up instead of unveiling and unloosing. Everybody's binding up instead of loosing the people that are in bondage. You remember what Jesus said about the religious folk in his day? The most religious, the most moral, the most upright people, the people who know the most Bible were the Pharisees. And he said, you catch somebody and make him a proselyte, and then you make him twice the bond slave of hell that you yourself are. You teach him these damnable things, said you won't you stand at the gate, you won't let him go in. You won't go in yourself, but you're blocking him off. How many people I've seen who would not accept deliverance themselves, and they blocked off some desperate person and said, Oh, no, you don't want to go over there. Oh, my, no, that would be terrible. Here, take another aspirin for your cancer. And it's not going to help. A young man came to me just Sunday, and he, he was very distraught, and he was upset. And he'd been going to a certain church, and I know the church, I know the pastor, the man's a man of God, it's a charismatic church, and they, they love the Lord, they're doing a lot of good. And he said, my pastor said, I should stay in every service at the church. I just told him what you need to do, son, is to come here a while and get free. You're so bound up, it's going to take a while to unwind you. I said, your grave clothes are on pretty tight. And I said, well, son, you'll have to decide what you do. That's up to you and the Lord. But I said, let me ask you this. You went regular to that church. And I, I, said, they, I said, Pastor so-and-so is a fine man. I know him. He's a godly man. He loves the Lord. He loves the Word of God. And they're doing all, I have no criticism to offer him. But I said, they don't do deliverance. And they never will because they just don't think it's important, don't, don't believe in it. And I said, you went there. Did it help you? He said, no. I said, do you think that now going there faithfully will help you? He said, no. I said, well, this is the only place in town. I know where you're going to help. I said, when you got the only wash terry in town, it goes all the time. I mean, you get all the dirty laundry. Some of these preachers looking for some program to bring the folks in. All that do is start doing deliverance. You won't have to go look for them. You'll have to run and say, shut the doors. There's more coming. Lord, have mercy. There's another carload pulled up. Where'd they come from, you know? I mean, you don't have... Uh, listen, when Jesus went out, and when people get upset, you know, because deliverance is going, you you'll, you say, oh, yes, I've been around. Now, I've heard about Winwood and Ferris Miller and that Carol. He went off the uh, deep end, too, I understand, over in Kentucky. Yeah, fooled around with Yeah, fooled around with word. That, that's pretty bad. And you hear them carrying on about it, you know. You say, well, at least they didn't go to the streets. They talked about it some, but they hadn't done it yet. That'll scare them. You know, the daylight's right up. When they start fussing at me, I just say, well, you know, we haven't gone out on the streets yet. Now, a sparkle comes in my eye. That's a new field. We haven't worked yet, you know. Of course, that's the day we'll get locked in jail and cause riots. That's what happened when Paul did it. Mm-hmm. He worked on that little fortune teller for an hour. Some people say, well, they just speak and they come out. I said, is that so? I said, I'd like you to read me the part about Paul and the little fortune teller, please. It said, within the hour, the Spirit came out. Now, Paul had a lot of moxie. He knew a lot more about demon casting out than I knew. And he had a closer walk with God than I've got. He had a lot more power and authority than I have. So if it took him an hour or a better part of an hour to get a fortune-telling spirit out of somebody, it's not going to bother me any to spend three or four hours after one. I mean, I'm not, it, I'm not proud. It doesn't bother me. I just think, well, praise the Lord, we did get it out. And I still stand by my guns. I like the way we get them out better than other people don't get them out. And when they start criticizing and saying, oh, you're not doing it right, I say, well, how are you supposed to do it? They say, well, you're supposed to speak, and they leave. I said, is that so? Walk over and speak. You see, the major conflict between deliverance, and what Brother Ferris was talking about last night, he made it very clear. I saw this major conflict coming up right after I got into deliverance. The followers of Brother Hagin, Brother Copeland, and others, and those are good men. But you see, they speak, and it's done. Now, what are you going to do when you run across a bunch of demon chasers and say you've got to fight? until you get them out. 
you speak, and you speak repeatedly. Hmm? That's where the heads are going to bang, bluey. Brother Miller's right. That's, that's where the conflict lies. The easy, easy way. I run across there once while what I call the glory boys. You know, you know them, don't you? Oh, they love this. But they don't love that. That's hard work. That takes a lot of time. That rumples your clothes. Not going to get me down on the floor, but there's no danger. <laughs> and you'll hear them say, I don't believe in that. That's obvious. The demons are not afraid of them either. They're roosting on their shoulders and all over their folks that they minister to. And they keep saying, just believe it, friend, and it's there. Take it by faith. Friend, there's a lot of things you take by faith, and I believe in that. But there's also some things you can know because it happened. Amen. You know, I first believed by faith that I was going to get born again by receiving Jesus, and then something happened, and I knew it. Now I have faith plus the experience. You can believe you can get delivered, and then when you get delivered, you'll know it. Amen. Well, my lens, you can't even... A lot of people, you know, they say, well, I don't know, you get saved, you might know it, you might not. That doesn't make any sense. My lens, you stick your finger in a light socket and come in contact with 110 volts, you'll dance a jig. <laughs> you mean you can come in contact with anything as big as Almighty God and not know about it? Well, if I got saved and didn't know it, I'd be afraid I'd lose it and never miss it. <laughs> you know, I mean, if it's no more important than that. And I'll tell you something else. When you come in contact with his satanic majesty, you'll know about it, too. And when they leave, you'll know it, too. They'll be conspicuous by their absence. Do you know people can even breathe deeper when those things leave? A lot of times when we go through delivery, somebody's been delivered, I'll say, take a deep breath. And I'll say, do you have more room? I'll say, you know, I do. It seems like I can just breathe deeper. I said, how about that? In some way, I don't understand. They take up space. That isn't theirs. It belongs to the Lord. And Jesus said, God anointed him to preach the gospel to the poor. The gospel is the good news that God loves them. He sent them to heal the brokenhearted and to preach deliverance to the captives. So on a lot of corners, you'll see Deliverance Temple, Church of Deliverance. You think, praise God. And you go in there and say, I want to be delivered. They say, all right, we'll pray for you to get well. In Jesus' name, be healed. There, you're delivered, brother. You say, but I don't feel any different. You don't have any faith. Mm hmm? You're welcome. Oh, listen, friend. That shallowness and hypocrisy, let's don't dodge it. Brother Ferris was right on this morning when he was talking about this business of, you know, you can be bold when he was confronted with blindness. <laughs> oh, what a difference, you know. Viva la difference, huh? You like to be put on the spot like that? God doesn't mind. But you know something? When you get in a jam like, like he was talking about, you say, I've never been in one. You start walking the Lord, you'll get in some of them. I'll tell you, you'll examine the fabric to look for every thread bare pace. Like he's talking about, he lost interest in eating. Boy, for him, I'm sure that's difficult. And, <laughs> sorry about that, Brother Fred. And uh, the, uh, he, uh, oh, that's right, he preaches tonight. I'm going to get it tonight. But, uh, no, but seriously, you'll examine every smidgen, and all of a sudden, from the spiritual giant, you become the little black ant. With a huge monster coming towards you, blindness, good Lord. Well, Lord, I know you did it, but, you know, don't you have somebody else that could help? I never shall forget. I ran into, not quite that bad, Brother Ferris, but it was, it was pretty bad. I went over to a meeting, and 
nearby town. I'd heard about this man over there and went over and he happened to be a Pentecostal evangelist from out of California somewhere. And this is some years ago when we just gotten into deliverance. And been, so I went over there and, and so he was lengthening legs and he was straightening up bowed legs right in front of the congregation and pigeon toes were being straightened. And I sat there and I said, praise God. Now, that's how they do it. I heard they did it, but I didn't know how they did it. And I'd never seen it done. And he was he just commanded that leg to lengthen, and it just moved right out. And I said, boy, that's great. If I run across somebody with a short leg, I'm going to get them in the car and bring them right over here and uh, get this man to fix their legs for them, you know. Well, I made one little mistake. I took a couple of carloads of those wild young people from my church with me to that meeting. And they also got enthusiastic about what was going on. So on Wednesday night, we were back in our services. The house was full. We started the invitation. I said, if this anybody has any needs, just come on. But here come one of these 19-year-old boys, grinning like a goat-eating briars. I knew he was up to something. He come wandering up to me, grinning. He said, Brother Worley, said, B.B.'s got a short leg. We measured it back there. <laughs> I felt like telling him, Robert, why don't you shut your mouth and go pray or something? I like to die right on the spot. And everybody all around was so excited. And I was panicking inside. My wife was panicking over at the Oregon. My son told me later, he thought, oh, what if it doesn't work when Dad prays? I was surrounded by faith. <laughs> and being the pastor, of course, I showed no fear. And I thought, good Lord, here we go. She said, I thought, well, maybe they made a mistake. So I said, well, let's check it. And we said, oh, Lord, it was, it was short. I mean, I tried every way to make it match, and it wouldn't match. That girl had a short leg. So the devil said, well, preacher, why don't you just tell them you can't do it? We'll have to wait and take them off that meeting tomorrow night. Well, now, pride comes in handy once in a while. I thought, no, just it's now or never. We'll just go ahead. I'm, I'm over my head now. I'll have to sw uh, sink or swim. We'll just go ahead and flop around a little and see if we can swim. You know, might, maybe we can keep it. So uh, without much faith, I said, in Jesus' name, I command this leg to be lengthened. I sounded very sure. Nothing happened. Absolutely nothing. The devil said, why don't you give up? I said, no, sir. By that time, I was getting aggravated. I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, let this leg be lengthened. Everybody, nothing happened. Sweat popped out. I don't generally, I don't generally sweat, but I, I was getting hot for some reason. And it wasn't spiritual heat I was feeling. Uh, did you ever get sweaty and cold chills at the same time, you know? That's sort of the way I was feeling. And I said, the devil said, why don't you quit and give up? I said, won't you shut up? In the name of Jesus, let this leg be lengthened. And it moved. And I almost fainted. <laughs> with relief, you know? And it moved on out. And I said, now, isn't Jesus wonderful? <laughs> Thank you, Lord. I knew you loved me, but I really appreciate how you verified it again. You know? <laughs> Deliverance, you'll never argue anybody into it, friend. If you believe in deliverance, you weren't argued into it. Now, you think about it. You may have been pushed into it by desperation. You might have fallen into it by having one dumped into your lap like I did. I mean, you know, if somebody pitches you a hot potato, where are you going to throw it? You know, you, there ain't nobody to throw it to, so you just, you just have to go ahead. By the way, there is a nice way you can handle people who criticize deliverance. <laughs> there is. Uh, there's been a, one time there was a preacher up in our area who had a radio program, and he got on the radio, and he just blasted us out of the water. He didn't call our name. He was too nice and religious. That wouldn't have been very religious to call us by name. So he just did everything but call our name. Everybody knew who it was he was talking about. 
these preachers right now in here supposedly casting demons out of Christians right now. I've heard of anything so ridiculous. And he just scoffed and he went on and on. Somebody came and told me about it. I said, is that so? Hmm. So when we took prayer requests the next time in our church, I said, I think we ought to pray for both so-and-so's church. They seem to have some difficulty believing that Christians can have demons. Let's pray that one in a person that he knows is born again will manifest right in his services. It took a couple of weeks, and then, boy, it exploded like a volcano. And they ended up having to bring it to our church to get delivered. But I get you, you know something about him, though? He got on the radio and apologized and said he was wrong. But he appreciated the Hegwish Church and Brother Worley and that crazy ministry they had because there wasn't nobody else had little enough sense to tackle it, he guessed. <laughs> no, seriously. Well, there was a Baptist preacher who took an actress one time. And, oh, he just chewed. Well, some of his folks had visited our church on Friday night. That's terrible, isn't it, to go visit another church? <laughs> now, they didn't visit and leave their services. They went, we were having service on Friday night, and they didn't have nothing. Them. But he heard they'd been there a couple of times, and he got all steamed up about it. And after all, we're Baptists, too. <laughs> we just, you know, we're just not exactly standard-type Baptists. We, we have a lady in our church. They spent $40,000 on the sky. She didn't help or not. She's, they sent her home to die in two months. That was... A little over two years ago, we ate her house the other night. <laughs> Praise Jesus, a schizophrenic completely healed. Can't be done, but Jesus did it. We got three of them in our church. You say, you must have a church full of crazy folks. That's right. I guess. At our church, I tell them, we, our church is loaded with the, the lame, the halt, and the blind. People drag in there saying, he's just hanging with church. I heard y'all doing deliverance. We say, yeah, drag on. You see, we just don't put them on airs. We just sinners saved by grace. We got the same rotten material in our church that all the other churches got. We just admit it, and the others are too proud to let on. <laughs> but in our in our church, God's busy renovating and working things over. <laughs> sometimes he drills out of place and puts in a new plug. And sometimes he shaves off some knots and other things. Somebody comes to me and says, I'm just going to quit. I say, try it. They look at me funny. They think I'm going to say, oh, please don't do that. I say, go ahead and try. Try to uncouple. See what happens. Did you ever see a train going down the track? The engine just, the locomotive just chug, 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 chug. That old big diesel pulling along, you know. All the cars are on the track just going along. car on the rear side says, I don't want to go on this old stupid track. I'm tired of this. So it just jumps a wheel off. You know what happens? The train goes chug, 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 chug. What happens if that coach got a wheel off? It's hitting the cross ties now. <laughs> it tears that car all to pieces unless they stop and get her back on track. You get off track, all it'll do is tear you to pieces. Won't stop the train. She's going through. Only way you can do is pull the emergency brake and say help, and they'll come and Get a Derek and put you back on the track, and then you'll you'll just creak because you're all shook up, you know. Ooh. I'm all tore up, you know. Have to run you in for repairs. Don't jump track on God. It won't do you any good. You can't get loose. Did you know you didn't decide to hook in? You said, yes, I did. No, you didn't. My Bible said God picked you and me before the foundation of the world. Amen. You say, it was up to me. It was not. It was up to God. At the moment you got saved, could you quit? Do you think Niagara Falls, you think a toothpick can resist Niagara Falls? Toss it in the sea. Let that toothpick say, I'm not going over. Listen, when that grace of God came sweeping its there was no way you, you didn't have any breaks. God's grace latched in on you. You said, but I wept and cried. That's not what saved you. You never knew you were lost till God told you about it. You didn't go looking for God. You say, yes, I did. Not until the Holy Spirit looked for you first. 
You say, I wept at the altar. That's because the Holy Spirit broke your heart. Hmm? You don't get saved by weeping. You get saved by accepting. You may weep before you accept, but that's all right. But you get saved just by the raw, beautiful grace of God. Oh, Bible teacher, I used to call it the amazing, astounding, abounding grace of God. And did you know something? That grace is at the root of the provision for deliverance from evil spirits. God didn't just save you for nothing. He saved you to be clean, purified, and to walk. Jesus said, I'm supposed to preach deliverance of captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised and preach the acceptable year of the Lord. This is it. Who is our pattern? If this is what he was supposed to do, he did. He's the pattern son, isn't he? He's our pattern. Preach the gospel. The word preach is keruso, which means to proclaim or tell abroad. To tell abroad the gospel. Heal the broken heart. I believe some people have a ministry of helping people get themselves together. To break the demonic spirits that break people's hearts and wound their spirits. I've seen beautiful things happen when we've led whole groups of people to forgive those. Here last night, some lady, I don't know who she was, some dear lady, she came for help, and I led her through and showed her how to forgive some people who deeply hurt her. And when she finished, she looked up at me with tears in her eyes, and she obviously felt much, much better. A load had lifted. She didn't even know she was carrying it, or at least she didn't know what was causing it, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. <laughs> It's time for somebody to love the captives. It's, some, it's time for somebody to love. Do you know what, how important love is in this thing? It's so important that Jesus said, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if you have the biggest church in town, if you have the greatest missionary giving in your church, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you knock on every door in town. By this shall all men know you are my disciples, if you have the biggest bus fleet. Some people, you know, some churches get in trouble with having the Lord move, and so they birth a bus program to try to pop up. And they start hauling the kids in away from their families, which is not scriptural. If they want to do something with that money, now, of course, this is my personal opinion. You understand. I really think that they ought to establish little neighborhood storefront churches and get mom and daddy and the kids into a church rather than bust the kids away from the family into a big central church and teach the kids to get away from the family for anything spiritual. God put the families together. It's a deception of the enemy. I'm not saying that. Now, of course, I'm always misunderstood because people think. You see, I'm not even a Sunday school man. I have departed from the faith, haven't I? You say, Worley, well, I knew you was a skunk, but I didn't know you was a spotted hyena on top of it. You know, that's about like saying you don't believe in Mama, isn't it? Do you realize that the Sunday school is unscriptural? Book chapter. You know why the Sunday school came into existence? It came into existence, check its history, at a time when the preachers were either liberal, away from God altogether, or were the ones who were fundamental were busy arguing all kinds of great theological truths that nobody understood except the preachers, and they didn't understand them either. And the poor layman sat out there and didn't know what was going on except, my, our preacher sure must be preaching a good sermon. I can't understand a thing he's saying, but it sure sounds intellectual. We got an educated preacher. Of course, I don't know what he's talking about, but I mean, you know, it sounds good. And it was at that time that the Sunday school came into existence on the trail of some prayer meetings where people were desperately seeking God for more. And it put the Bible down in the lay people's hands and they began to teach the Word of God. And that's how the Sunday school came. It came because the church was not doing its job. You know what the church program is? 
preaching the Word of God, coming together to worship, with songs, hymns, testimonies, the operation of the charismatic gifts, preaching of the Word of God, followed by signs and wonders. Now, that's the best Sunday school you'll ever get into. And don't you go back home and try to tear up your Sunday school now. Whatever you do, but you might devote some prayer to it. I am convinced that the churches have spent a great deal of money and time. If we had spent more money and time on camps to teach deliverance and to teach the preachers how to walk in the Spirit of God and do miracles and signs behind the Word of God, those children would learn more about God's Word and the more important, mom and dad would learn, and dad would get on his feet as the spiritual head of the house, Amen. and they'd sit down and have Bible study in Sunday school in the house every day. Amen. And that's where the Bible puts it. In the Old and New Testament, the children were taught at home. And don't misunderstand me. I love children. I've done a lot of children's work. And most kids hate Sunday school, as you know. That. If they get to a certain age, you talk to them. Oh dear, I hope there's not any here. I don't want to cause anybody any problems. But seriously, the Word of God followed by signs and wonders is the best Sunday school you'll ever find. You know, it's funny. We haven't had Sunday school for seven years. It started out because we didn't have room. But I'd already known for a long time the Lord wanted to get rid of it, and I didn't know how to kill Mama without having all the getting lynched myself, you know. But it worked out just fine because we ran out of room, and we didn't have room, and we didn't have workers. And had you ever thought about how much misery the Sunday school causes? Let's look at the negative aspects. Every year, you have to get teachers and officers. Were you ever on a nominating committee trying to find somebody who would teach those classes and be the superintendent? Have you ever tried to trail down and see that everybody was in place and see that that class had a, that class of wild kids over there? Those little boys that run everybody nuts had a, had somebody to get a hold of them, and nobody oh, said, "Oh no, not that junior." No, uh, uh, I, I don't feel like it. I believe I've got a headache. I feel it coming on, <laughs> you know. And you say, "Well, sister so and so had that class, but she said she was sick too." She said, "I don't blame her. I would I'd be sick if I had to come." You know that sort of thing. How many times have, have these things caused many many headaches and problems? And yet, at home is the ideal place. But you see, we've kept our people so busy coming to meetings. The lights have to be on at the church every night, don't they? At Baptist churches, they do. I mean, why else would you have lights? You didn't have a party or, or something. You know, you'd have to have something. How are you going to justify those hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of buildings sitting there? I mean, you've got it, it's kind of like Washington. You've got these bureaucrats in office... And you've got to have something for them to do to justify the fact that they're there. If they run out of something to do, they'll have to lose their job. It sure is getting quiet in here. <laughs> well, if I've taken pot shot at your sacred cow, well, don't, don't believe me. Just say, I don't believe worthy. That's all right. You think you're right, and I know I am. So, you know, we can get along just fine. No, seriously, but I think we ought to pray about these things. I believe that God wants the families on their feet. And I have never seen anything in my life like deliverance to get men on their feet in the heads of their houses. I was up in Maine. Oh, that was a lot of fun. It was virgin territory. <laughs> Nobody else had been up there and chopped in that thicket. I'll tell you, there was just lots of, there was lots of varmints in those woods. And I just found my share of them. I just had more fun. It, I tell you, I just enjoyed myself. Did you ever go fishing a pond where nobody had fished? I mean, you didn't even have to. I mean, you'd, ever, you'd get a strike every time you throw the line out. You know, that kind? Oh, that, that's nice, you know. But when it's kind of been fished out, you know, you kind of have to be, you know, you have to be selective. But, boy, when, when nobody's fished there, every time you throw the line out, you get a bite. Boy, that's great. That's sort of the way it was up in Maine. I mean, they were just all over the place, and it was just beautiful. So I just had myself a field. And one of the most beautiful things, I, I, this girl came to me, and she said, uh, she walked up to me after the first night, young married lady, and she said, You know, Brother Worley, I just don't agree with you. I've never heard anything like that in my life. 
I said, well, that doesn't mean it's not so just because you hadn't heard it. I said, there's a lot of things you may not have heard. But I said, that's all right. I'm not mad at you about it. I said, she said, well, I'm going to go home and check the Bible. I said, good. That was on Friday night. The next morning, on Saturday morning, I was at a full gospel businessman's breakfast in another part. And I got there, and here comes this, here comes this young lady running up to me. She said, oh, Brother Worley, I was up till 3.30 this morning. I said, well, what were you doing, Maureen? She said, I was running references in my concordance, in my Strong's concordance. And she said, I ran them in the Greek and the Hebrew. And every one of them said, you were right. There are spirits, and I've got them. <laughs> and she said, at 3.30, I said, all right, Lord, I give up. He's right. And he said, I want deliverance. And I said, well, praise Lord. As soon as we get through preaching, I'll be right with you. And sure enough, boy, down on the floor she went and screaming demons. They started screaming and carrying on. And those people standing there like could slap their eyes off of the paddle. They'd never seen the herd tell us what's going on in their life. This demon talking to me. And I noticed a wedding ring on her finger. And I said, this young lady's husband here? He said, yeah, he's standing right back there. I said, get around here, boy. Come on. I'm going to put you in the saddle. He looked at you know, like, oh, my goodness, you know. Because <laughs> he didn't know nothing. Uh, he was a believer. I said, you are born again, aren't you, son? He said, yes, sir. Think about this. I said, that don't make no difference. I do. You come on. I said, you got more authority than anybody around here. I said, now, you just repeat after me. And boy, I started feeding him what to say. And that demon went berserk. Get him away from me. Don't let him touch me. He has authority. I said, I know it. <laughs> and you know what I'm talking about? At first, he was real hesitant. You know, he'd just pair up the phrases I was giving him, you know, and that demon started reacting. And I'll tell you, that killer instinct came out in him. His eyes began to sparkle. And pretty soon, I didn't have to tell him nothing. Boy, he was going after him. Oh, you get out of my wife. You come out of there right now. And I, and I mean, he said, I'm her husband. You get out of there. I have authority over you. You come out of there. And I said, I just sat back and said, get him, boy. Get him. Get him. <laughs> And I saw this happen. I don't know how many times these young husbands learned what authority they had. You know something else? That was a Jezebel spirit. That thing looked at him and said, I hate you. Looked at me and said, I just despise this thing. And this B-I-T-C-H said, I told her not to obey him, too. I said, well, we're going to fix that. I said, when you leave, it'll be different. Morning. He said, shut your mouth for me. <laughs> I tell you, I just have more fun. Don't you feel sorry for me making trips across the country? I just have so much fun when I get to thinking about it. You know, I've, I've got hours and hours of tapes, of screams of the enemy, I call it. You know, just excerpts from different sessions. And if I ever get where I can't sleep at night, I put on a tape. And I just relax. Just bathe with, ah, no, no. Mm, so soothing. So relaxing. Well, you know, I, that's the way I felt about it. And I'd put uh, uh, a lot of the, I've got a lot of sermon tapes. And on the end of the sermon tapes, I'd leave the tape open when we'd go into deliverance. And all these, you know, soothing noises would come on the tapes. And then people were telling me that got the tapes. They said, ooh, I had to turn it off when I got to the end of that thing. So those screams came. I like to jump out of my chair. <laughs> I said, well, I find that that's soothing. That's kind of like nerve medicine. You know, it just soothes me. Makes me feel better. But you know, if people have those things in them, they get upset when they hear their brothers in despair. <laughs> a lot of times we'll be at the church, you know, and there'll be some terrible things going on from one side of the fence and glorious things from the other side. Depends on which side you're on, you know. And uh, so a lot of times I look at that demon and I say, it's a bad night for demons around here. And what I'm saying, it always is around this damn place where we You'll excuse me for quoting him verbatim, but he says worse than that sometimes. But you know, the blessed thing is that you and I have authority to set people free. God in heaven has ordained that we not walk in bondage. And I'll tell you something else. People say, well, you know, I'm not completely free myself. That don't make no difference. If Jesus waited for a perfect instrument, he'd have to wait till he got here, and that'd be a little late. He's got a program running that needs workers right now. So he gives on-the-job training. You help deliver people a while, and then it'll be your turn. That's right. 
That's the way it works. And deliverance, if you work and help other people get free, it's amazing how it'll work those things that are in you up to the top. Because they get disturbed. And sometimes we have what we call ricochet deliverance. That's when somebody's working with one person and it bounces off and hits somebody nearby and they start manifesting. It doesn't make any difference how they get out, just as long as they get out, does it, people? Praise the Lord. We want them out. We want people to be free and to be different. Free to walk with Jesus. Deliverance to the captives is part of Jesus' program. And I believe it ought to be the program of every child of God to do what they can to set people free. Now move cautiously. This is not a game. Now I have a lot of fun. But I would remind you it's extremely dangerous. But it can be done. But who wants to be safe? It's dangerous to take a bath, too. Do you know that? You might slip down and break your neck. Lots of people do. Thousands of people every year break their neck in bathtubs. That's right. That's right. You're living in dangerous times. Are you going to stop? It's dangerous to breathe. You might breathe in something polluted. Hold your breath. <laughs> Isn't that silly? No, I tell you what. Find out what God says and do it. You say, well, I heard that those things threatened to kill you. Yeah. Isn't that exciting? You say, well, it doesn't excite me. It scares me. Why? Why would you be afraid of going home? First place, the devil can't arrange it unless God wants it that way. And the second place, if they do arrange it, you'd go home as a martyr. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> you could dance down the golden street saying, Hallelujah. These things, they always tell me, I'm okay. Well, they have, they're pretty well stopped. It. They, don't, they, don't, they don't offer me nice things like they used to. They used to offer me real nice things like they're going to torture me to death and drive me insane. And, and uh, they'd like to tear me limb from limb. I smear my brains on the wall. You know, nice, tender feelings. They revealed how tenderly they felt about me. Uh, they don't do much of that anymore. They used to always tell me they're going to kill me, you know. And I say, really? Are you sure? Yes. I said, when did you plan to do it? Well, we're going to do it today. I said, oh, praise the Lord. I'll shout all over heaven and tell Jesus, you helped me get there. <laughs> About the best I ever got your blankly blank mouth, Worley. When I'm told, I said, you don't have sense enough to be afraid. I'm not afraid to go home. My business is to stay in the center of God's will. And there is safety and security, and when I go home, if I die, I die. If I live, it'll be under Christ. Isn't that the way Christians ought to be? Why would you be afraid to die? Are you born again? You mean you want to live in this mess? That would be better than going to heaven? Well, then what on earth did you ever let the devil put the spirit of fear of death in you for? Some of you have had it since you were a kid. When I was here before, I think... Some people lost the fear of death when I talked like this. Some people had been literally terrified all their lives of dying, and they couldn't talk about it because that wasn't very religious. In deliverance meetings, you don't have to be religious. You can just talk right out about the thing that's bothering you and go right to the root of it and hit it. Praise the Lord. The Bible talks about those who all their lives were in bondage because of a fear of death. That bondage is over, people. You don't have to live under that kind of bondage anymore. And if you're really secretly tormented by a fear of death, you ought to get rid of it. You say, well, I just, I get scared thinking I might die of cancer. Why? In the first place, cancer roots in unforgiveness and resentment. So clear the decks on that, and you won't give any ground for those things to grow in. Cancer and arthritis particularly. In the second place, if you die, you're going to heaven. So what? Do you realize that all our fears are rooted in a lack of trust in our wonderful Lord, who is so able to take care of every situation without exception? Amen. And if we could ever get beyond just talking about how wonderful that is and start enjoying the fact that it's so, wouldn't that be great? Now, that'd be liberty. That'd be freedom. And I believe God's leading people into this type of thing now where they can believe God. And the fear of death is a terrible yoke to live under. 
don't live under it any longer. And every time the devil comes and says, you're going to die, say, praise the Lord, I'm glad you told me. A lot of times, you know, people have voices that come and say, you're going to die. We're going to kill you. And they go, they go, I'm just going crazy. These voices keep telling me I'm going crazy. I said, tell them, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hope it'll be soon. Wouldn't that be great? You know, they start praising the Lord for it, and those voices stop. The devil doesn't promote praising the Lord. He promotes the other side. One of the best ways to put the cork in the jug is just start telling those things, I'm not afraid, not anymore. Fear is a handle that fits all the devil's tools. Don't get hooked in. Let's stand. You've been so patient and so attentive. Praise the Lord. Maybe we could say something about that name or something. If you need help, by all means seek it. If you're here, your relationship with the Lord is not clear. You don't know for sure about your salvation. Seek help today. Just tell somebody here at the front, I want to talk to somebody about Jesus being your Savior. I'm having problems knowing about my relationship. Get it sound. And if you're being tormented, harassed, and driven, by all means, seek help. Amen? Come on. Jesus, Jesus, This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home.